Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We give you praise, we worship, and we pray. We thank you for the word of exhortation we've heard today. We thank you because you are the one that has given us power to get words to establish your covenant. We pray, O God Almighty, that you continue to stir our heart up for missions, for souls. Lord, that you will use us individually and corporately in this church to continue to take nations for you. We thank you, Father. We give you praise. We bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, it's going to be a short exhortation-ish um, on what I've titled The Breath of Life. The Breath of Life. In between the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and Pentecost, I think you have 50 days. And in the Old Testament, <laughs> in the Old Testament, you have the, the major feasts. Uh, one of the major feasts was Passover. Another major feast was Pentecost. At some point, I will do a series of teaching on the feasts and festivals of the Old Testament and what they mean for us, the New Testament church, and for you and I individually. And we'll, we'll go through that very well. We will we'll do a proper teaching on that. But in the church calendar, we are now in between um, Passover and looking to Pentecost. So the Jews, for example, they still mark those Old Testament festivals and they mark them very well. They take them seriously. Even though they still reject the Messiah, they're still looking for the Messiah to come when he has already come. And they just refuse to acknowledge him for now. But we know that the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, the time will come when their eyes will be open. But for now, the Messiah has come and gone. And the church has been, was birthed. You know, when Jesus came and, and, and rose up again. Some say that the church was birthed when Jesus breathed is better of life upon the disciples in the book of John chapter 20 verse 22. Some go further and say, well, it was really born on Pentecost day. But the point is, it's, it's all about Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and what he has come to do. So, we're gonna look at the old creation how it began, and the new creation, how it began. Now, we know that the Bible says that he that is in Christ Jesus is a new, what? All things are, but all things have become new. All right? So, if we're talking about new creation or new creature, you can't talk about new unless there was old. Does that make sense? Yes. And to understand, and, and, and the way God works in the Bible is that he uses the things of the Old Testament as shadows, signs, symbols, examples, patterns, that when we study them, and we understand the principles within those shadows and types and signs and patterns, and as we come to the New Testament, we get a better understanding of the New Testament. Are you following this? And that's why, as a Christian, you can say, well, I'm born again, I don't need the Old Testament. No, you do. You do, one, because it's part of Scripture. And you do, two, because it helps you to understand the New Testament better. And it's a continuation. The New is a continuation of the Old. Right through the Old Testament, you see Jesus everywhere, in every book of the Old Testament, you see Jesus right there. Before he now pops out onto this side of the life in the New Testament. And then he's alive, but physically he's not here, so he sent us the Holy Spirit, and then there will be a time that he will come back physically here. So you can see how the whole thing is connected and progressive. Yes? So the old creation, takes us back to the book of, guess what book? Genesis. 
In the book of Genesis, let's look at chapter chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. That's verse 1. Verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he has done, and he rested on the seventh day. Now, God rested on the seventh day. <laughs> the reason why somebody said, um, here, I think, is because only two Tuesdays ago, we were studying the book of Hebrews chapter 4, and we're looking at God saying to us that there is a rest for us now. And that we need to enter that rest. If you didn't come for Tuesday Bible study, you need to come. I'm not going to go over that. In fact, I think last Tuesday we were looking at chapter five, but on the uh, what do you call it? On the flip chart, I think we still had the chapter four notes there, uh, and there was a question about you know how do you enter that rest? And somebody who was there for Hebrews five, who wasn't there for Hebrews four, said, "I wish I was there." last week because I want the answer to that question. <laughs> we all want the answer. We want to know how to enter into his rest. But here, the Bible says, God rested on the seventh day. It's, it's a phrase I've used a few times in my family to say to them, look, even God rested on the seventh day. What is this? Leave me alone. Sometimes it works. So, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Verse 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herd of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. We had something about that earlier today. It looks to me like God did not cause it to rain on the earth, because what's the point? There was yet no man to till the ground. So if he caused the rain to fall on that ground and it is not tilled, it's just going to become a jungle, uncultivated, unfruitful. Therefore, there's no point. So he had not yet caused it to rain on the land, which meant the moment man was created, and man said, I'm ready to till the ground, rain came. I wonder whether God is waiting for somebody to say, I'm now ready to till the land. Amen. I wonder whether the rain had been held back because you are not yet ready to till that land. I wonder what your land is that God is waiting for you to till for which he had already provided his rain to fall upon. And I wonder whether today you will say to God, I am ready to till that land. Let your rain fall. And God had not yet caused rain to come on the earth, for there was no man to till the ground. That was verse 5. And there was no man to till the ground. Verse 6, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. I want you to pay attention to this. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, let's break that off. God bless you. That's somebody should call me the living being over there. <laughs> so God took dust. He formed man. But that man that he formed was not yet a living being. What's the opposite of living? Okay? So he had formed man, but he was dead. And I'm talking about the first birth. It wasn't until God himself now breathed, and the Bible says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life that that dead body that had been created and formed now became a living being. Living means life. Now came alive. But that is still talking about the first person. Now, since then, 
Every man or woman, child, man here talks about mankind or humankind. I'm not trying to be political. All right, leave me alone. You know what the Bible says. You know what it says. What it means when it says man. Yes, human, human being. Every human being that is born experiences this. God doesn't have to come each time the baby is about to pop out and breathe on the baby. He had already done that and he set in process a principle that just continues through childbirth. But that is still talking about the physical birth. In um, children's discipleship class this morning, we spoke about if you are born once, you will die twice. If you are born twice, you will die once. So some of the children went, hmm, <laughs> they scratched their head. And then they understood, and then they explained it back to us. And what the children explained back to us was this, that if you are born physically like everybody is, or if you are born, if you are not born spiritually, that is one birth, not two. You will die twice. You will die physically, and then you will die spiritually. To be dead spiritually is to be separated from God. To be dead spiritually is not to have the spirit of God on the inside of you. Therefore, you cannot be in the presence of a holy God, for God is spirit. But if you are born twice, means that you've been born physically like all of us have been. And then like Jesus said in John chapter 3 verse 5, when he says, Marvel not that I say to you that you must be born again. And the key word there is again. Which means that he acknowledges the first birth. But there is another birth. The second birth. Born again. He said, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. But when you are born again, the Bible tells us you will not taste of the second death. So you only die physically or you will not die spiritually. You get it now. So here we are tracing that back. So we have the first birth. But the first birth involved the breath of life. The first creation, the old creation involved God's breath of life for it to be a living being. But that's the first birth. The second birth, also the second creation, the new creation, also involves what? The breath of life. The breath of life. The word breath there is pneuma. Spirits, the word spirit sometimes is used for pneuma. You know, uh, you've heard of the word pneumatic. Yes? What does pneumatic mean? What does it mean, pneumatic? You said yes, so you have to tell us what it means. Yeah. <laughs> the scientist said that. Yeah? He talks about air, right? Air being pumped out. Okay? So that's talking about, so the Holy Spirit is, was breathed like an air that was pumped out. So when God at creation breathed upon that body that he had formed of the dust, remember, he formed that body from the dust. That body did not evolve from another creation. It did not evolve from, I don't know, a monkey, for example. No, God formed it. And then he breathed the breath of life upon it. And that's how the first man or man was created. The breath of life in the New Testament, it talks about the Holy Spirit. So fast forward now to John chapter 20. John 20. The breath of life. In John chapter 20, let's read from verse 19 to get a bit of the context. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, 
this be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then we come to verse 22. Now remember, at this point in time, Jesus had come to the cross. He had died on the cross. He had been put in the tomb. On the third day, he had rose again. They went to the tomb. They couldn't find him because God the Father, by the Holy Spirit, as Romans chapter 8, verse 11, 10 and 11 tells us, if the Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, that same Spirit will quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. So it's the, by the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus had been raised from the dead. He's no longer in the tomb. The tomb was empty. But he was yet to ascend to heaven. He was still walking around. So that's the picture. That's the point where we are. So they gone to the tomb. They couldn't find him. Now, they were afraid because you know how sometimes you can stand behind maybe your parent or a strong person and you can go, ah, 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 you can't touch me. All right? But Jesus is no longer there. So the Roman soldiers were there. Uh, so they were kind of afraid. If only Jesus was here now, you would have, you know, but it's gone. So it's now down to them to do it. So they were afraid. They were afraid. And they went and they gathered together. At least they gathered together. They assembled together. But the Bible says for fear of the Jews. Because the Jews were after them. And then Jesus came. And he stood in their midst. That's verse 19. And he said to them, peace be with you. So we go back to verse 22 now. So, in verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also sent to you, I also sent you, verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Why didn't he just say, Receive the Holy Spirit? Why did they have to breathe on them? In the same way that God the Father, wow, that door just moved. <laughs> In the same way that God the Father at creation breathed upon the man that he formed. Because the breath of life, the spirit of God is vital for the new creation. It's vital. And it says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, that was in the book of John. It wasn't until Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now, we're going to do a study on this at some point. Maybe on Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday, I might speak on the Feast of Pentecost and all of that. But it says fully come, which meant that it had been coming, but it had not come fully. There had been celebrations of Pentecost, but the day of Pentecost had not fully come. The Jews had been celebrating and are still celebrating the feast of Pentecost. But until Jesus came, the day, capital D, of Pentecost had not fully come. But fast forward to the year 2019. We can look back and say the day of Pentecost had come fully. So all that Pentecost represents is now fully available. And it is only available through Jesus and as we receive the Holy Spirit. 
Over the next few Sundays, I'm going to be teaching on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I want you to be ready. I pray, I pray that the same anointing and grace that God releases when I teach the ministry of the Holy Spirit at the Bible school will be released in our midst. Amen. For those who have been to the Bible school here and who have been through that particular model, you can testify to stuff that happened. Sometimes I don't even know what the Holy Spirit wants to do. But every year he's done amazing things. Honestly, the greatest manifestation of the power of God that I've seen in my ministry apart from on the mission field, when you see signs, wonders, and miracles, is when I teach the ministry of the Holy Spirit at the Bible school. This last model, this year, it got to one particular day. And I felt the, the people were not ready for what God wanted to release. So I challenged them. I told them, I told them exactly what I believe the Lord was saying to me, that God wants to release more, but you guys are not hungry. So it's limited, because you're not hungry. There's no space to contain it. And I told them to fast and to pray, and listen to what God will do. And I gave God an assignment. Now, when I begin to teach the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I don't want anybody sleeping. Now, this is not the time to close your eyes. So I'm not looking at anybody, but just in case somebody is closing their eyes. You must not miss this. Don't let the enemy steal this from you. And I told them to fast and to pray. And I gave them some assignments. And over the course of the next few Sundays, I'm going to be giving those assignments as well. And the assignment is just to prepare us. It's not a magic. It's not a, it's not a formula. But it's just something to help us to press in and to be ready. And then it came this day, and I had everything ready that I was going to teach. And I'm telling you, I've never seen it like that before. I just did a few scriptures, and the whole atmosphere just changed. And I said, okay, we're going to pray. And then we started praying. And the Holy Spirit showed up. There were prophecies. Uh, there was a particular lady who maybe because of child care, she would come with her young son to Bible school. Uh, usually the son would stay in an until room until after the service. But I don't know why, maybe on that particular day, he kind of stood at the, at the back in the corner and uh, the mother was flat out on the floor, uh, you know, slain in the spirit and I don't know what God was doing with her, but God was doing something. And then she went to the back to sit and to gather herself, and then as she now tried to stand up to come back to her seat, she just fell, and the son just ran out of the room. <laughs> I'm thinking, it's not me, it's got nothing to do with this. There was a gentleman to my left, and we were just worshiping God. I was just, and I'm thinking, Lord, I had the, it all worked out, you know, my, my lecture notes, I knew we were talking about the Holy Spirit, but don't mess my lecture now, what's going on, you know? So, my logical mind was still trying to come in and thinking, how am I going to cover this particular bit of the syllabus today? Then I realized that, no, 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 you got to let go. So, even me, I was helpless. I was not in control. Just like everybody else, I was wondering, okay, what, Lord, so what do you want to do now? Okay, let me know when you are done and what you want me to now do. And there was a gentleman to my, to my left, he stood there, and then we were just, you know, praying, and then uh, me too, I closed my eyes, I wanted my own. <laughs> you know, this is a pass me by, uh, gentle savior kind of, pass me not by, you know this song. Uh, I wanted to tap into my own. The next thing I heard was a sound, he had just fallen all by himself, nobody touched him. I'm like, whoa, okay, all right, so you come on, focus, focus, me too, me too, Lord, me too. And there were testimonies. There were scriptures that were coming out. I was praying for some people. I gave a particular scripture. The person came back later and shared a testimony how that was the scripture that God gave them when they were backing off from ministry. And that was the exact scripture. I mean, 
some of the assignments people talked about when they were in their in their in their rooms and they were praying. Uh, and, and one of the assignments, let me tell you, one of the assignments was a very simple one. Pray in the Holy Spirit for 15 minutes every day. One prayer point for the whole of the 15 minutes. Lord, I want to know the Holy Spirit more. Holy Spirit, reveal yourself to me. I want you to know you more. That's it. And the 15 minutes is not part of your regular prayer time. It is on top of. That's the only condition. So no cheating. <laughs> so if you are the type that prays two hours every day and everybody said, So now you pray two hours and 15 minutes. And if you, if you are the one that does 30 minutes every day, now you pray 45 minutes. But the 15 minutes is specific. The only other thing is get your journal ready, get your pen ready. Whatever the Lord says to you, write it down. Write it down. That, that was one of the assignments. Now there were other assignments like you must, you know, little things like you must read the book of Acts, all 28 chapters of it like five times within the next two weeks. I mean, small things like that. <laughs> and you must memorize maybe like six scriptures in Romans chapter 8 that talks about the Holy Spirit. You know, which is, those are the easy bits. You know, memorize. And then I will ask people to come and recite it. Hello? No. We're still here? Yes. Okay? So it's little, little things like that. But the whole idea is to get us to press in. And anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. But I'm preparing you to say that from next Sunday, I'm going to start a series of teaching on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I want you to come ready. And there will be times that we're going to fast and pray. Take it seriously. The assignments take it seriously. It's not a religious thing, but it's to help us press in. We want to know the Holy Spirit more. And we'll just see what He will do. Because even me, I'll be expectant. Part of the testimonies, the way, the, sometimes I will go to the class and ask. In fact, the first day that I taught on the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we were still having the Bible school at Downey Road. We, we would have a break. Some of you who have been to Bible school, I don't know, it's only two hours lecture, and then they'll have a break. And then during break, they are eating jollof rice and chicken. <laughs> two hour lecture. I say, what is this? <laughs> anyway, so we had a break, and I went from this, the, the, the argument was that they were coming from work. I mean, some of us are coming from Africa, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and then we would um, so during the break I went downstairs because of the way I parked my car and I thought we would park my car somebody had blocked me in no, somebody parked where I should have parked is the other way around. and I had blocked them in thinking that they were a student uh, down the road if you know, parking is restricted so there's only a few spaces in front of the church building which is reserved at that time of night for those who are coming uh, for, for Bible school. Then I noticed just before break that there was a gentleman sitting at the back who was not one of the students. And I'm thinking, what's he doing there? Later they told me that he was the person that has the car that I had blocked him. So I went to him to, say, to apologize. From the second floor to the ground floor, he gave his life to Christ. Before we got them. And I said, God has brought you here and trapped you <laughs> so that you can receive salvation. From the second floor to the ground floor, he gave his life to Christ. And so many testimonies like that. There was another person during that time, they said that during the sessions they received an, an, an idea from God that led to them starting a creative thing online that they had to protect by copyright. I almost felt like, you know where your tights belong, but I did, I did not say so. I resisted the temptation. There were those that 
got married. There was a certain lady, she was in the States, and she just came to the UK. Just, she talked just for a while, and she was going to go back. And then she thought, well, while I'm here and things are being delayed, uh, I'm just going to get serious with God, just get into Bible school. That was like six years ago. Today, she's still here. She's now married and has a child and is in ministry. Because the, God used the Bible school to help her to find her purpose, her destiny, and her calling. All sorts of different testimonies. There was one, and I shudder to say this one because the dean of the Bible school said to me, and I cannot then take it to her. She said that there was one student who, at the graduation of the previous set at Prayer City, had had a dream before the graduation, and in the dream, he had seen somebody teaching. And then on that Sunday morning, while we were on stage, they saw me amongst the people. And then they ran to the dean and said, that's the person I saw in the dream. And they were talking about what they saw in the dream now. I wasn't told this until after that year was over. And that person, anytime they saw me at Prayer City, there's a way they greeted me. I'm like, stop it, this, this nonsense. <laughs> but all sorts of crazy stuff that God just does. You know, when the ministry of the Holy Spirit is being taught. At the tester session, I will ask the people to come hungry, to come with their faith raised high, because God will show up. I just knew that. He will show up. I was talking about the, the lady that then got married. Now, it, it turned out that during their wedding, I was the speaker, I was the preacher at Hall Street when they were getting, going to get married. I think I've shared this once or twice before, but I can't forget. So we went for the rehearsal. The wedding was on a Saturday. I, I remember because that was the Saturday that Tanya was also sitting for her 11 plus exam. So in the morning I had to drive to some place in Kent to drop her for the exam, then drive back home, then change, then drive <laughs> to Hall Street for the wedding. And, um, but the Thursday before, we were having a rehearsal, and her husband's best man, I just saw something about him, and I called him aside, I said, by this time next year, <laughs> it's gonna be your turn. But it, it, it was, I didn't say it uh, blatantly, but there was just something that just rose up on the inside of me, and I left it like that. Then another time, maybe about six months, nine months in, something like that, I was at prayer city in an evening service, and I saw another young lady who was also in Bible school. And as I was looking at her, I just called her. I said, you've got some good news for me. What is it? And they said, well, it's about your son. And I'm thinking, my son, now yeah, Timmy. What, what is it about Timmy? <laughs> but they were referring to the person that I had given the word of prophecy to, and they were not there when I gave the word of prophecy to that young man. So they now said to me, uh, has he not come to see you, sir? <laughs> I said, no, he has not come to see me. What is the story? They said, we are getting married. Yeah. So the guy now came to my office to see me. So when he came, he did not come alone. He was going to get married, and this time he also came with his own best man. <laughs> So I was looking at both of them. And then the best man also said, pray for me, pray for me. <laughs> connect me, connect me. <laughs> True story. I said, it doesn't work. I will pray for you, but I can't. I can't just walk around like that. <laughs> and all sorts of things that God, God has done. There was a gentleman who was sitting, sorry that I'm pointing, I'm imagining that I'm in Bible school, I was sitting somewhere around there, by the aisle, just like four seats back. And as the prayer was going on during that time, I was talking about this is this set that is going to graduate in, in August. He just burst out crying. I mean, he's a big man with beard and everything. He was just crying and just bawling like a little boy. I'm like, okay now. So when it all settled down, 
And then he began to talk. He began to talk about how God had called him and asked him to this or that and the other. I won't go into the details of confidentiality or reason. And how during that moment, God took him back to that call and how he had moved away from it and now he's going back to it and he's going to work fully in it. And I don't know what it is in your own situation that God is going to burst, burst and God is going to do. But I, I, I share some of these testimonies to prepare you and um, to say, take this seriously. Um, let's open up to God. Let him do what he wants to do. John chapter 20, verse 22. So at the old creation, God breathed into, uh, into man's nostrils and became a living soul. Another translation says a living being. In John 20, verse 22, Jesus, at the new creation, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. <coughs> And in closing, I'll just mention this. <coughs> Dust plus God's breath equals life. We saw that in the Old Testament, Genesis 2 7. Dust minus God's breath equals death. Yes? This is true physically, and it is true spiritually. So spiritually, dust which talks about humanity or mankind plus God's breath equals life. And that's why Jesus had to breathe the breath of life afresh on them. Why do we say it's the breath of life? Because John chapter 1 verse 4 tells us, John chapter 1 verse 4 says, In him, Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 